right, so uh, glad to be here. I hope you are. We just want to say thank you to everybody who's, you know, given us so much support, the staff, and uh, a, a lot of times, you know, the lead pastor sort of gets the credit, the spotlight, so to speak, but listen, if it weren't A, for the staff, and then primarily B, for all of the support staff, volunteers, uh, what we do here at New Life Church would not be even remotely possible. So while today and this month you know, is officially Pastor and Church Appreciation uh, Month, from us to you guys who volunteer week in and week out, those who are in kids' ministry, student ministry, behind the scenes, working tech, and all that kind of stuff, the band, everybody, thank you so much for what you do. You know, our appreciation towards you is, uh, is, is beyond measure. So thank you so much. Um, we are in week four of what is, for us, a longer series than normal. Uh, this minor leagues series is eight weeks And we are attempting to cover the majority of the minor prophets in the Old Testament. Um, There are 12 of those. So obviously in eight weeks we won't be able to cover all of them. But we're going to get the the biggest majority of them. And I want you to remember something that I mentioned the first Sunday right out of the gate. And I've, I've been trying to remind you of this, if not every week, at least every other week. Is that minor, minor prophets does not mean lesser. Minor does not mean less significant or less relevant or any less important. And the reason I say that is because there is another group of prophets in the Old Testament called the major prophets. There are five of those. The likes of Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, you know, those uh, major prophets. And, And the reason there is a distinction called major and minor is because the major prophets, those writings are longer. That's really the only reason. Those writings are longer, the minor prophets are much shorter in length. For example, we talked about Obadiah in the first week of the series. And Obadiah is the shortest of all of the minor prophets because his writing is only one chapter long. And from there, there's a wide variety from from Obadiah's one chapter to you know, up to 14 chapters and, and everywhere in between. And so that's the reason for that. And we've already covered several of them. Obadiah, we, we've talked about um, Haggai and Zechariah. We actually talked about those together in week two because they have uh, similar themes as prophets. And then last week, if you missed it, what, last week we talked about Hosea. If you've never read the book of Hosea, you should take the time this week to do that Watch last week's message online. What an incredible message of God's mercy, mind-blowing mercy that is enacted, sort of like lived out in real life the actions of the prophet himself. So you really want to go back and watch that if you missed it. Today, we want to turn our attention to our next minor prophet, and his name is Micah. His name is Micah, and so you'll find that. Uh, Again, toward the uh, end of the uh, Old Testament, you have Obadiah, you have Jonah, and then Micah. So go ahead and find that in your Bible if you follow along with me that way or on the app. Uh, Something interesting about Micah is he prophesied during the same time period as Isaiah. Remember, Isaiah is one of the major prophets. Micah, unique uh, in and of himself, he is the only minor prophet to have ministered to both the northern uh, kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judea. So he ministered during, during the divided, what's called the divided kingdom period in Israel's history. So you have Israel, kept the name Israel, to the north. Its capital is Samaria. And then the southern kingdom is Judah with the capital of Jerusalem. Um, so Micah is the only one who went with God's message to both groups of people. And something else really interesting about Micah, and you may find this uh, funny, odd, or even a bit creepy, is Micah was so passionate about his message, so distraught over the sin of God's people, that in chapter 1, you may not even believe this unless you read it for yourself, but in chapter 1, it says that Micah went around weeping and wailing publicly, 
that's not the best part. But he did so declaring God's message, get this, barefoot and naked. Now, wouldn't that get your attention? Like, man, if I just dropped it down to my skibbies right here, you know, it would be like, he must have something really important, but I don't want to look, you know. That's Micah. You know, listen, I don't know why. There are some things in the Bible I just don't have an answer for. That happens to be one of them. Uh, but if you focus in on the man's message, that's the most important part, obviously, the man's message, here's what you come away with. Uh, there is a theme in the book of Micah that I think is echoed throughout Scripture and even in the other minor prophets, that God is not like you think he is. God is unlike anything and anyone to whom you could compare him to. And that got me thinking about a time when I met someone. Uh, maybe you've had this experience where you had in your mind what the person would be like, and then you met them. And, and the way you thought they would be, how they would act, their personality, it either matched your perception, your preconceived notions of them, or it was something totally different. Um, for me, and it could be somebody famous, maybe a TV personality or you know, a race car driver or a you know, famous athlete or something like that. It doesn't have to be, but um, for me, I'm going to show you a picture here in just a moment. Years ago, Jessica and I, my wife, we, we met someone, and I'm so proud of this picture. I've shown it to you before, and I'm so proud of it. I'm going to show it again today, and if I can work it into another message another time, I'll show it again. Um, but when, when this picture comes onto the screen... Those of you who are at least my age and older will recognize this person immediately. Younger people, you'll have no clue who this is. This illustration will just go right over your head and be lost on you. So just hold, hold tight, and, and uh, we'll come back to you here in just a few minutes. But um, several years ago, this is probably, when I say several, I'm talking like early 2000s, you know, early 2000s, uh, Jessica and I got to meet and get our picture with this guy. None other than Kirk Cameron himself. I, I've been accused of being his twin. <laughs> and he heard about that and grew his beard out just like me. And it's gray, just like mine. I don't know why he has to be my copycat, but uh, he must think very highly of me. But uh, those of you who know who Kirk Cameron is... Uh, he, he was one of the stars on the 80s, 90s sitcom Growing Pains. Uh, he since starred in some Christian films, uh, notably Fireproof. If you remember years ago when Fireproof came out, he was the, the main character in Fireproof. And now he works uh, on a lot of faith-based projects. He's really, um, he really emphasizes the work of evangelism, still does some filmmaking but I remember this event that we attended that night. He was the keynote speaker. And at the end, they said, hey, if you, know, you want to uh, meet Kirk and maybe get a picture or anything, just get in line. And so, and so we did. And we're thinking, well, you know, it's uh, probably one of those once-in-a-lifetime kind of opportunities to meet somebody who uh, really the world recognizes on TV. And so we got in line. But to be totally honest with you, I wasn't really excited about it because in my mind I had already... Uh, sort of conceived this notion of who he was and, and how he might would be. And so I'm standing there waiting in line thinking, Kirk Cameron. You know, he's probably a jerk. You know, he acts, he acts all nice and smiles, and, you know, but, but he's, some, he's some movie star, TV star. He's got all this money, and he's probably a, real, in real life, he's probably a snob. And when we get up there, it'll be like, you know, hey, how are you? And shuffling people through and that kind of thing. Uh, man, was I wrong? Really? Kirk Cameron. And now if he was putting on a show, it was his best performance. Because I'm telling you, Kirk Cameron is one of the nicest guys I've ever met in my entire life. You know, the, anything good you could think about him your preconceived idea of who he is and his personality, may it be based off the TV show or whatever, spot on. Super respectful, super courteous, you know, generous towards you with his time and attention. I mean, really, when we finally made it up to where we were the ones in line to, to shake his hand, get this picture or whatever, 
it was as if we were the only ones in line. Nobody else mattered. We were the most important people in the room. It genuinely made us feel like we were the movie stars, and it was his honor to be, uh, have a photo taken with us. And that's great, you know, because it doesn't always work out that way, does it? There, there are probably some of you have a, an experience of your own and a story where you met someone and, and what you hoped they would be like, what you thought they would be like, totally different in a, in a really bad or negative way. So it, so it happens. Well, in a broad sense, that is the message of Micah. We have these preconceived ideas and notions about the character and nature of God, but when it comes down to it, God really isn't like what you think. God is not perhaps the way you have been told He is. He, he is not, as the way some people describe, He is not a God who would remind you of you know, some kid who takes his magnifying glass out just to look for ants to burn them just because he's mean. Right? You know that kid. Some of you school teachers have that kid in your class this, this year. And they go to church here, unfortunately. You know, nah, we, lo- we love them all. We, we love them all, the broad spectrum of kids. But, you know, we get this idea that, that, that God is just, just full of anger and relentless fury. Now, no doubt, we have seen a, a very consistent theme in the Minor Prophets, that God is righteous. He is a God of justice. He will, he must judge sin the sin of pagan nations, and the sin of his people. But that should not lead us to believe that he's simply full of fury and and that God takes pleasure in the pain or punishment of people. He does not. He is a patient, loving, and compassionate God. And that's the way Micah wants us to see the God he serves. And, And we begin to actually see that message and hear it in Micah name because of what it means. Micah is short from Micaiah. And it stands for who is like Jehovah? Who is like God? Is there any other God like him? Is there anything or anyone on earth like God? Or like our message title uh, says today, he's not like you think. Is there anyone to whom he can be compared? And, And so we begin to see this Uh, sort of revealed and played out as Micah confronts the sin of God's people. Again, he's ministering to the northern and southern kingdoms, both of which have committed grave sins against God and also against one another. And so in chapter 1, God begins to bring a charge against his people because of their adoption of pagan rituals, idolatry, And they have even gone so far to adopt the practice of temple prostitution. And so in chapter 1, verse 7, God says through the prophet, All her idols will be broken to pieces. All her temple gifts will be burned with fire. I will destroy all her images. Since she gathered her gifts from the wages of prostitutes, as the wages of prostitutes, they will again be used. Now, if you read all of chapter 1, It echoes something Isaiah said. Remember, Micah and Isaiah are contemporaries, meaning they are ministering and prophesying, preaching to the same group of people at the same time. Well, in Isaiah chapter 42, verse 8, Isaiah declares on behalf of God, I will not share my glory with anyone. That's God's message to his people. And you can hear that in what Micah says. God loves you. God wants his best for you. However, his judgment is near upon you because he will not share his glory with another. And so God's judgment is imminent because of their treatment of God. Their contempt and disrespect for God. But also because of the way they treat one another. In chapters 2 and 3, they're indicted for taking advantage of the poor. They defraud one another. Their leaders, their priests, their their so-called prophets have become preachers of prosperity. And as long as you pay them off, you pay them the wage that they ask for, it says here that they would prophesy, that they would preach goodwill and prosperity for payment. 
those who wouldn't, who wouldn't pay, couldn't pay, well, they received, you know, the, the vengeance, so to speak. Chapter 3, verse 5, they prepare to wage war against him. If you didn't pay them off, then they would come against you in their full fury. They would seek to destroy you, to ruin you financially, and take what they wanted by whatever means possible. Well, this is not so, so foreign to us today, is it? Unfortunately, we have pastors, preachers, false prophets who for a sum of money preach prosperity and goodwill toward the people. It's absolutely despicable because they're taking advantage of people and their hard-earned money. Now, we could go chapter by chapter through the book of Micah highlight all the sins of the people and God's response. But I think what we find is in chapter 6, we have a good summary. This is sort of like the climax of the story. It's also where we find what you could call the theme verse, like that key verse that brings the entire message of Micah together. It's Micah chapter 6 and verse 8. And you'll actually notice it if you uh, use our series note cards. It sort of looks like a retro baseball card. Over here where it says section, row, and seat stands for Micah 6, 8. This would be a fantastic uh, Bible verse for you to memorize this week and beyond. And here's what it says. He, talking about God, God has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Again, a great memory verse for anybody to work on this week. Now, before we come back to that, I want to I spend a little time talking about a few verses and ideas that, that build up to this particular uh, verse because what leads up to it sort of shapes for us an overview of the message of Micah and his attempt to help us see God not through our own lens, not through our preconceived notions or understanding of Him, but to see God for who and how He really is, a God who is unlike any other. And he begins to describe the uniqueness of the character and nature of God by pointing us to, this is number one, the reasoning of God. The reasoning of God. Now, those of you who are, who are married or in a serious relationship, you've probably had the experience of, you know, disagreement, conflict in your relationship where, you know, you, you have the responsibility to communicate with your spouse or with your uh, fiancé, your significant other, your displeasure, your frustration. And now sometimes we do that very directly. We just say what's on our mind and we say it in the tone in which we feel. But every now and then, a couple will share disagreement and frustration in a more uh, passive, indirect way, somewhat sarcastic and usually using questions. It might sound something like this. Honey, have you ever thought about taking out the trash instead of just letting it flow over into the floor? Well, darling, yes, I have. But don't you think it would be helpful if every now and then you took it out yourself? Well, sure, Sugar Plum. I would, be, I would be more than happy to do that if, don't you think, it would be a good idea maybe to put dirty diapers in a different bag or a different can? Oh, well, if we're going to talk about dirty diapers, why don't you try changing some? You see how it's going, you know, like back and forth. And, and, and so, you know, just sort of uh, politely but clearly expressing our, our displeasure. And on it goes, well, that's, that's sort of chapter 6 of Micah. You could call it a disagreement or an argument. Uh, it's really more like a court scene where God is, is proposing questions. He's confronting the sin of Israel through questions. But here's the thing. The questions don't point directly to Israel's sin. The questions focus our attention on the character and the nature of of God himself. There's four of them, and they start in verse 3 by God asking his people, have I mistreated you? He says, my people, what have I done to you? They are acting disrespectfully, contemptuously toward him, 
They are rebellious and unfaithful. And all he wants to know is, hey, what have I done? How have I wronged you? Going on in verse 3, he asks the second question. Have I required too much of you? Some translations have it this way in verse 3. How have I burdened you? Have I required too much? Have I made your load too heavy? Is life too difficult for you because of me? The other two questions you'll find in ch uh, chapter 6, verse 10 and 11. And God asks his people these questions. Have I approved of the way you treat each other? You know, do you think that's okay? Do I give my seal of approval for that? Number four, have I blessed your get-rich-quick schemes? You know, how you're taking advantage of one another. Now, in a moment, Israel is going to have some questions of their own. But before they have the opportunity to answer God's questions, he answers the questions himself. And he does so by way of reminder. He says, let's just take a walk, if you will, down memory lane. He brings up the exodus. In verse 4 of chapter 6, he says, I brought you up out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. So you remember verse 3, what have I done to you? How have I wronged you? I brought you out of slavery. You know, don't you remember it was the Egyptians who mistreated you? It was the, Egypt the Egyptians who put you in slavery and oppressed you and took advantage of you? That wasn't me. I am the one who brought you out of that. He continues in verse 4 to mention Moses, you know, their godly leadership. He says, I sent Moses to you to lead you and also Aaron and, and Miriam. I don't think I've wronged you. I delivered you from slavery, the exact opposite. I even gave you godly leadership so that you wouldn't be overburdened, so you wouldn't be with, without direction. Again, have I, have I mistreated you in some way? I don't think so. In fact, and this is verse 5, I want you to remember this. He says, my people, remember what Balak, king of Moab, plotted and what Balaam, son of Beor, answered. Remember your journey from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. Now, if you haven't done a little bit of uh, digging and Old Testament reading in, in the history of Israel, you might not understand that that statement may be lost on you, but... I want you to go back sometime this week and read those two stories. Numbers chapter 22 through 24. And there you will have the story of, well, what did happen there with Balak and Balaam? Joshua chapter 2. What did happen on that journey from Shittim to Gilgal? In summary, in the first case, there were people who intended to curse God's people, to bring a curse on them. But instead, God turned it around and made it a blessing. In Joshua chapter 2, when, when God's people were, were uh, moving toward the, the, the promised land, they reached a place where it, it looked like they were totally um, at, a, at a dead end. There was no way forward. The Jordan River blocked them. And God parted the rivers of, of, the, uh, of the waters of the Jordan River so that his people could pass through. In other words, I'm, where there, when there was no way, I made a way for you. Do you remember that? Now you tell me how it is that I've mistreated you. How is it that I've been a burden to you? How is it that I've required too much of you? In fact, I did all of these things so that you would, this is the end of verse 5, so that you would know the righteous acts of the Lord. And the word know there is not just to, to know it in your brain. It's to know it in your heart. To experience it firsthand. I did these things so that you would know, that you would understand the righteous acts of the Lord. Another way to put that is so that you would know me the way I want to be known for who I really am. Right? Right? So again, this is, this is revealing that God is totally different than the way we sometimes think that he is. Instead of raining down fire and fury, which he could have totally and justly have done, he shows patience. He questions sinful people. He wants to lead them to a place of understanding, not only of him, but of themselves and their sin. Why? 
Well, again, because God is not like other gods. Study the world religions. The gods of other religions are angry, full of vengeance, ready to strike people at any moment. But God is compassionate. God is patient. God is loving and, and kind and, and merciful. If you don't believe that, you don't believe that God is, is patient with sinful people like Israel and like you and me, let's read their response. This is Israel's response, God's people's response to his questions. And now when I read this, you don't have to answer out loud, but in your mind, you tell me if you wouldn't just squash them right then. Right? Like, enough's enough. I'm tired of them. Here's what they say, starting in verse 6. And, and one pastor suggests that their response should be read uh, somewhat sarcastically and with contempt. They said this, With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? In other words, the best of the best. Verse 7, will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my tr transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? God, is that what you want? Now, in the house that I grew up in, my mama called that back talk and it wasn't tolerated. That was smart mouth stuff right there. And, you know, and if I'm in the position of God, thankfully I'm not, right? That would, want to, that would make me want to smack them. You know, watch your mouth. Don't speak to me that way, you know? But that's, what they, that's how they answer. God, well, what's going to make you happy? It seems like the best that we do is not good enough. Like you're never satisfied. And in, in, in all honesty, there's been times in my life where I've wanted to ask God the same thing. God, when is, when is enough enough? When, when are you going to be pleased? When are you going to be satisfied? And of course, those are moments of, of faithlessness and frustration. But again, what we see is God reacting to his people in a way that is totally unlike what you and I may expect. He responds in a way that's totally different than the way we might think he, he should or, or would. And number two, here's what he does. Micah shows that the requirements of God, still unlike, unlike anything or anyone you could ever imagine, there's no comparison. God's requirements. Sinful Israel wants to know, God, what is it that's going to make you happy? How are we supposed to please you? What is it that you require of us? What do you want from us? Do you want a calf a year old? And what they're referring to is the requirements of the law to bring uh, a sacrifice, an offering that was free of blemish. So think about a perfect specimen. And a calf, according to the law in Leviticus chapter 22, could be offered as early as eight days. But anything offered to the Lord had to be perfect, without spot, without Blemish, it couldn't be lame, broken, or any, anything like that. had to be perfect. Now, think about it. If you had cattle, and you had a perfect, a perfect calf, how much more valuable would that calf be, say, in the market, if you let it grow a year? It would be one of your prized possessions, right? It would be the best of the herd. The best of the best. And, and so that's what they're asking. God, is that what you want for us? Do you want from us our most valued possessions? Would that make you happy? What about rams? What about oil? What if we gave you 10,000 rams? Would that be enough? Instead of just a little oil, what if we could produce a river? Think about that. A river of olive oil. God, would you then be satisfied? Or would you still require of us more? Maybe even our own children. What if we sacrificed our children? Is that what you're after? Our kids? Of course, they know that is absolutely disgusting. They know that that's a pagan ritual of the nations that surround them and that God calls it detestable. Nowhere in Scripture do you find Him requiring of us 
to sacrifice our children for his sake. And so it's just, it's extraordinary that they would go to these extremes. And again, you would think that perhaps if God were much like us, his patience at this point would just be run out and say, okay, I'm done. You know, I could, I could wipe you guys out, start all over. But God's not like what you think. And that brings us back to verse 8 of chapter 6 where he said, He has shown you what is good. He's shown you what the Lord requires to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. You see, what God requires is not a mystery. It's not complicated. It's not some hidden gem that only a few know about. It's not unreasonable. It's very simple. It's clearly stated. It's very straightforward. Now, some, and I think they, they sort of uh, are getting off base here, some would take Micah 6, 8 and, and present it as these are the requirements for, for a right relationship with God. In other words, like for salvation. God requires you and me, sinful people, to do these three things in order to gain right standing with Him. But I don't think that's what it's saying at all. Because nowhere in Scripture can we support that God expects works on our behalf, works that we do, works of righteousness or rivers of oil, to please Him. Because sinful people cannot please Him. There's not enough oil in the whole world. There aren't enough rams in the world. There's not enough righteousness that you and I could do in a lifetime that would please God. So I think what we see here is sort of a, a look into the future. That by faith, we have to trust that God, indwelling us, living in and through us, will produce the things that please Him. You see, it's faith that really pleases God. And, and you could sum up Micah chapter 6, verse 8, with the word faith. What does God require of you? Faith. Faith in Him. Faith in His Son and His finished work on the cross. Faith in His indwelling Holy Spirit because that's how we can live justly, walk humbly. That's how we act righteously through Christ. I mean, think about it. How many of us sitting here this morning, apart from a personal relationship with Christ, have any chance of doing justly? In other words, doing the right thing because it's the right thing. How many of us here can really uh, come to a place in our life where we love to show mercy? <laughs> Without Christ, it's impossible. How many of us, what's the chances that we walk humbly with God without the Holy Spirit in our life? No, it, it can't be done. And so that's what God requires. God requires faith. Faith in Him to do in and through us what pleases Him. Now you're probably looking at your message notes thinking, wow, he's got two more points in like two minutes to say them. All right, so I've taken a long time to get to where we are, and, and there's a good reason for that. It's because if you read the message of Micah and you miss the fact that God's not like you think He is, you miss the fact that he is patient with sinful men and women like you and me. And you miss the fact that he requires nothing of us but faith in him to do what we cannot do. You've missed it. You've missed the whole message. And so what comes after this will mean absolutely nothing. You, you, you won't appreciate it. Because you've missed the main part. So, so that's that. Alright, so let me fill in these last couple blanks for you. Uh, Micah wants us to see that, that God's unlike any other, not only in his requirements, but in his retribution. The retribution of God is what he talks about in the last part of chapter 6. Micah warns Israel that, that there will be consequences to their actions, which is, which is something that we need to keep in mind. He's saying in the short term... There's going to be some fallout for the decisions that you've made, and it's not going to be very pleasant. We need to, we need to own that. 
Because the truth is, just because we enter into a relationship with Christ doesn't mean that we are immediately going to be handed uh, an immunity card for our wrongdoing. That there may be some temporary consequences. Like even as followers of Christ, when, when we make some bad choices, when we hurt people, when we uh, contribute and, and take part in sinful actions, there will likely be some short-term consequences. But God's not like what we think. And Micah says he won't stay angry forever. He won't hold it against you forever. And so we have this hope, and this is number four, the restoration of God. Micah knows that God has a love for his people then and now. He knows that in the short term, things for God's people, are, you know, the way of life and, and the consequences that they are going to uh, endure are going to get worse before they get better. But he wants us to understand that, again, God is not like what you think. He will not abandon his people. He will not stay angry forever. He will not hold the sins of those who repent against them. And so this is how he concludes his message in verse 7 of chapter 7. I watch in hope for the Lord. I'm, I'm keeping my eyes focused forward, right, ahead. I watch in hope for the Lord. I wait for God, my Savior. My God will hear me. Verse 18. Who is a God like you? Remember Micah's name? Who is like Jehovah? Who is a God like you? who pardons sin and forgives the transgression of the remnant of its inheritance. You do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. You will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl all our iniquities into the depths of the sea. I hope what you see in what Micah is saying, what he sees. I think he's no longer looking at the immediate, but he's, he's looking into the future. And he sees what God would do and what he would accomplish for sinful people at the cross. And he steps back in awe and wonder and says, wow. Is there any other God like that? Is there anything or anyone to whom he could be compared God is beyond every comparison. He has no equal. Who would forgive sin and forget like God? Who would carry the burden of guilt for the guilty? Now think about that. That's what Christ did for us, didn't he? He carried the burden of guilt for the guilty. Now let me ask you. If Christ did that for us, why would you want to continue to carry that burden yourself? If Christ has already bore your guilt on the cross, why would you want to waste another day bearing that guilt yourself? When he's offered you grace, forgiveness, and cleansing of sin. Like, who does that? Is there any other God? Is there any other thing, any other one in the world who does such a thing as that? Is there anything or anyone to whom he can be compared? Well, the answer is no. Not even close. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you've never entered into a relationship with Christ, receiving his, his gift of forgiveness, made possible by his finished work on the cross, where he died for your sin and for mine, for the sins of the world, and was buried and rose from the dead, if you've never put your hope in Christ, would you do that right now? You might say, well, how, Pastor, how do I do that? Well, the Bible says it's very simple. That you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sin, was buried and rose from the dead, and you confess him with your mouth as your Lord and Savior. Romans chapter 10, if you want to read that later. So let's do that right now. If you've never accepted Christ, would you take this moment and say, Dear Lord Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross for my sin, and even the sin of the whole world. And that your sacrifice there on the cross was sufficient payment for the forgiveness of my sin. You satisfied the very wrath of a holy God. 
You died, was buried, and I believe you rose from the dead. So that today, right now, I could put my hope in you. And that hope would not be disappointed. I ask you to forgive me of my sin. Come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. Help me from this moment forward to live a life that brings you glory. That, honor, that honors you as the God of my life. And prepare for me a place in heaven to spend eternity with you forever. If you're praying that prayer or something like it to accept Christ, please let us know. Fill out your connection card. You'll find one of those in the back of the seat in front of you. You can turn it in at Connection Central. And we'd love to have that information on hand. For the rest of us, if you, if you know Christ as Savior, you have a relationship with Jesus, perhaps something that we've talked about today just reminds you of just how good God is. I know sometimes our perception, our understanding of Him can get fogged. We can become disoriented because of you know, what life throws at us. And just how confusing, how frustrating sometimes life is. And so then we begin to reflect on God through that lens. But I hope today that the message of Micah is to remind you that God is not like what you might think. He's a God who loves you. He's a God who's patient towards you. He's a God that wants His best for you. All He asks is that you trust Him. That you trust Him and allow Him to work in and through you all that he requires. God, we thank you today that you have made it possible for us, sinful human beings, to please you. You said in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, without faith, it's impossible to please you. So Lord, we come to you in faith, believing that you have done everything necessary to meet all of your own requirements on our behalf. And through faith in Jesus, we participate in that glorious exchange. Our sinfulness for His righteousness. Our judgment for His acceptance. His adoption as, as sons and daughters of God. Man, God, it's incredible. Who is like you? Is there any other, Lord? Let our answer be a resounding no. There is no one. There is no one or nothing to whom you can be adequately compared. So to you be the glory, the honor, and devotion of our life. In Jesus' name, amen. We hope to see you next week.